closeness. I'm a little taller. Good afternoon, everybody. Like Maya said, my name is Ryan Dow Stanley. Uh, I'm a member of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. We're the indigenous peoples of uh, the southeastern part of this state. We inhabit uh, Robson County, Scotland County, Hope Counties, and surrounding areas. And uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm actually a student here at Carolina in the uh, School of Medicine. I'm a, a first year student in the Division of Clinical Laboratory Science. I also work as a laboratory technician at the UNC Cystic Fibrosis Center in their Tissue Culture Procurement and Cell Culture Corps. So I get a lot of science every day. I enjoy it. But one thing I'm not, and I can't lie about this, I'm not a botanist. I wouldn't even really consider myself a gardener. Haven't really been much of an outdoors person. I got pretty rough allergies. All my friends know can't spend more than an hour outside or else it really messes up my body. But I am still very glad to be here and I'm glad that I was asked to come and speak. Um, I travel around North Carolina, many different venues, and I teach uh, and I educate about indigenous peoples, particularly in the Southeast and North Carolina, and I demonstrate many aspects of our art forms, both visual and performing arts. And I'm really glad to be able to do that today because Native American people are, are to me, are just so good at incorporating the environment in every aspect of our culture. One of them is being food. Food is very important for indigenous people, especially my tribe. And you find uh, many different examples of how it influences all aspects of our culture. And culture can be defined different ways. I like to think of it as different parts. And just to give a few examples of how the environment and food play into that, one part is economics. So in the past, pre-contact, native people would have very large scale farms. Sometimes, unfortunately, you see images of native people and they're sort of tending to gardens and you know, uh, you know, some family gardens. But in reality, that's not necessarily true, especially here in the Southeast and the East Coast. Native people were huge agriculturalists and some of the earliest signs of domesticated plants were here in the eastern part of the United States. And there was a lot of people in a tribe who were very, had very specific skills and were very good at what they did, one being farming. And even today, you know, culture doesn't change the way people think it does. It's very hard to really lose aspects of your culture. It transforms and it gets influences by other cultures, but that doesn't make it any less authentic. So even today, my people are still farmers. If you actually go into the top of Lenore and as you're coming down the escalator from the dining hall, it has a map of different farms that um, uh, CDS gets food products from. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Or is that just me? A little bit. If you'll notice, two of those farms are located in Clinton, North Carolina. And what one, some people don't know about Clinton is that it is actually home to another tribe of indigenous people, the Kahari people. And they have been there for hundreds of years in that one area. And a lot of people, don't know this for sure, but I bet a good bit of money that a lot of people working on those farms are Kahari, uh, people from the Kahari tribe. And you know, I come from a long line of farmers. I think if I was a little disappointed when they find out how allergic I am to pretty much everything outside. So I hate to disappoint. But in our economics, is such a big part. Uh, Native tribes, they wouldn't just grow things like corn and beans just for themselves. They'd actually specifically have um, sections that they would grow to trade with other tribes. And in return, we would get different tools and things that aren't indigenous here. So food and agriculture is what made us more connected a long time ago. Before we had things like Facebook and phones, which I can say are great assets, but it was food a long time ago that helped connect us. It also influenced our society and how we lived. Again, the fact that we were agricultural people gave us some advantages uh, as a society, being able to remain sedentary. We didn't have to migrate to follow uh, hunting patterns for uh, animals or gather wild uh, fruits and vegetables. We were able to grow our own, remain sedentary, and that gave us an even deeper connection with our geography and environment. 
Another way you see food and agriculture is in art, both visual and performing. If any of y'all like to see afterwards, I actually have flowers tattooed on my body, if that gives any idea about how important in, uh, the environment and geography is to me. You see floral designs in paintings and potteries and throughout most of our art forms. It's actually a key identifier for a lot of other tribes. When you see those floral patterns, it's instantly recognizable as being Eastern indigenous people. And another example is our religion and our ceremonies. We actually have things like a strawberry ceremony for the Iroquois people, harvest ceremonies, green corn ceremonies, because that just again shows how vital our agriculture and food was to the sustainability of my people for many years. And real quick, I do want to uh, give an example. Like I said, I am a storyteller. Um, that's another art form we have. Indigenous people use stories to not just teach lessons, but also teach about our people and teach others how we view ourselves and the world around us. So I'm giving an abbreviated version of a story that I actually have a illustrated version on my table in the back if any of y'all would like to see, or if you want a copy, you can uh, please feel free to uh, talk to me about it afterwards. But it's, it's about a young girl named Chakora. And she was from a tribe in the southeast and part of North Carolina in this folktale. And it actually talks about our corn and the different kinds of corn we had. And it's a folktale that has been sort of passed around this, uh, the southern part of North Carolina. And it kind of tells a story about how we got these different types of corn. Uh, a lot of our corn that we have, um, and again, I actually have examples uh, at my table, is the solid red kind of corn. We also have this white kind of corn. It was grown by the Iroquois, Algonquin, Suwon peoples all over the southeast. And it was, like I said, it was grown a lot. And there were actually separate stories just about corn. And it was very important. Again, it's what got us through the winters. It's what gave us economic benefits with other tribes. It was very important and it was harvested, you know, on very strict cycles and a lot of our in, uh, technological innovations revolved around our agriculture and how do we get better at it. And one day there was this little girl, Shakur, and like many people her age, you know, a lot of people were taught how to farm and different skills at young ages and many people were multidisciplined and learned a lot of different skills. So Shakur was this young girl who was farming and one day she noticed something different about our corn. It wasn't just red anymore. It was actually this multicolored kind, which I have examples of up top. It had yellows and whites and reds and black, and it was integrated all throughout this corn. And as you would assume, this didn't really go so well with uh, their tribe. Again, they had gotten so used to this all red corn. Again, it had been a part of their stories and their ceremonies. And then out of nowhere, this corn just changed colors. So Chakor and the different people, uh, at first nobody would believe her. You know, they told her, oh, it was a bad strain. Somebody must have done something wrong. You know, they didn't really say it was a big deal. And then eventually all of the corn started looking like that. And then people got worried. They're actually afraid to eat it, which is a natural reaction when you're so used to this one type. Well, then they started uh, posting scouts to try to figure out what was wrong with this corn. And then they found something interesting which would affect how they viewed themselves and again, many parts of their religious aspects. They found these little people and in uh, the Shara language, they're called Yahashiri. And you actually find examples of these little people, Yahashiris, in many different tribes. The Cherokees have a version and many other tribes in the Southeast. And what the Yahashiri would do is they actually would go in the middle of the night and they would paint each individual kernel. The Yahashiri are known for being tricksters and playing tricks on different tribal people and they would travel and be mischievous. So they would actually take the time to paint all these different ears of corn and get them multicolored. And even, it's amazing to see how these ideas have spread through generations because a lot of older people in my tribe, like my great grandparents and uh, great-great-grandparents, they might not have known this particular folktale. It might not have been common knowledge, but some of the ideas were there. A lot of people actually still did have superstitions about the little people, and it was a common practice a long time ago 
to sweep footprints off dirt yards. A lot of homes, even in the 1800s, early 1900s, it was common to sweep footprints because the Yahashri, uh, you didn't want them to know uh, whose kids lived there. If your kids were walking around, you would sweep up the footprints so they didn't know who lived there. So that's, an, that's just an example I wanted to give. And again, that's a very abbreviated version. The whole book is up top on my table. But that's just a version of how you find food integrating itself and uh, different aspects of my people's culture. And again, it has a lot of significance to our cultures in the past, but it still has significance in our cultures today and in the future. You know, I live here in North, um, in Chapel Hill, but my tribe and my family resides in Robson County. And for some of those who don't know where that is, that's about two hours away from here. And about 95% of my family still lives in Robson or surrounding counties. So it's easy to feel a little left out. And even my two roommates in my apartment in Carborough are Lumbee too. And it's very hard for Indian people to leave their communities. I mean, we're, we're people who are so used to being part of these large families with very integral kinship ties and community ties. And it's hard to leave. So one way that we help feel connected to our people and to our home is through food. My, like my, I said, one of my favorite hobbies is to cook. And one of my favorite things to cook are the things that my grandmother and my grandfather taught me. And I still do that today. Just the other day, me and my roommates, we wanted to have a big meal. And there's actually multiple Lumbee people who live in my same apartment complex. And every so often, we'll cook these big meals that we would have in Robinson County, and we would all come over and enjoy them. And it literally feels like we're back in Robinson County at our grandparents' house. And that's just a very important part of who we are, is being able to connect to our families and to our cultures and our histories, even though we're here in Chapel Hill in predominantly uh, Caucasian, African-American communities. You know, sometimes we go and we don't even see Native people for, you know, for days. Uh, you know, I've had many classes at Chapel Hill where I'm the only Native American person sitting in a lecture hall, especially being a science major. I do not get to see a lot of Native people in my field and in my academic setting. But it's important for me, and it's how I thrive here at Carolina, how I've been thriving for the past three years, to know that I can do something like go back to my apartment with my Lumbee friends and roommates and still cook the same meals that I have with my family. So that's just a little bit, again, why I wanted to say why I'm here. And I hope you kind of remember these for our next speakers and for this whole program to show just how important food and environment and agriculture and our geography is to all kinds of peoples with all kinds of cultures. Thank you.